Hi everyone, Paul Wilson here. I'm going to be talking today in this workshop about Adobe Captivate's mobile responsive design workflow. I'd like to thank you for attending my session today. I hope you get a lot out of it. The first thing I want to emphasize is that while some people would argue that mobile responsive design is for only a small percentage of e-learning that's out there, I believe that gradually over time, in the next five years, let's say, it's going to be a competitive advantage for e-learning designer developers like yourselves. If you don't have this skill set, you could very easily be left behind. Today, we're going to break this session down into two parts. The first part, we're going to talk about the tools that are built into Adobe Captivate that allow you to design for a wide variety of different screen sizes. And I'm going to take you through all of those tools so they have an understanding of what's available. The second part of this session is we're going to take an old course that wasn't designed with responsive design in mind and convert it using the tools we learned about in the first section. Let's get started. So we're going to start at the very beginning here. We have um, our Adobe Captivate welcome slide here. Let's go to the new section if you're not already there. You'll see a variety of different project types. Obviously, what we're talking about today is responsive project. You may already be familiar with using the blank project, and that's a fixed aspect ratio project. In other words, the slide is always the same height and the same width, regardless of what device you're using. But of course, as we know, e-learning is becoming something consumed on a variety of different devices. So we need to start thinking about responsive projects just to remain competitive. The demand for e-learning on tablets and mobile phones is only going to increase. So we want to be familiar with how to build such e-learning courses. So I'm going to start by clicking on responsive project and clicking on create. Now, if you've created blank projects before, this will look somewhat familiar, but you'll see there's the addition of this layout preview bar across the top of your canvas. This has got some really interesting controls that will be really beneficial for testing your project on different devices or to simulate what your project would look like on different screen sizes. So from left to right here, we have a layout preview. Now, there's a bunch of defaults here, and of course, as time marches on, some of these become more relevant and less relevant. Uh, certainly, there's probably not too many iPhone 6s out there anymore. Uh, you might be more interested in testing it on the iPhone 10, 11, 12, and so on. Good news is, is that you can add to this list here. So, you can use a tool like how big is my browser, which you can open up on any device, including your desktop computer, and find out the exact aspect ratio, not of the screen. Remember, it's not the screen, but the actual space within the browser. That's what you're designing for. So if you wanted to add your own custom layout preview for a particular device, you can simply type in the values here. So for example, if I was looking for a device that had 400 pixels wide or 627 pixels tall, and then what you can do is click on Add Custom Preview. Give it your own name. So we could say Future Mobile Phone, something like that. Click OK. And that will be available in your list of layout previews. So you can check it out, not based on one of the defaults here, but based on maybe devices that your organization is actually using. The other thing you can do, let's return to desktop for a moment. The other thing you can do is you can use this layout preview play button to preview what your project will look like uh, very quickly across a large number of aspect ratios and resolutions. So when you press this, you'll see a quick preview across all those different widths. And of course, you can manually control this by using the preview slider. 
I can click on this with my mouse and drag it across until I get the size that I'm looking for. So let's go back to desktop view now and you can see here that it's pretty similar to what a blank project would look like. One of the things that makes responsive design work is organizing your content into zones on the slide itself. I like to think of this almost like a bento box for e-learning where everything has its own special place on your slide. If there's not enough room for that special place, that special place will move to another row or another spot on the slide itself. And this is achieved through something called fluid boxes. And you can add fluid boxes to any slide by using the fluid box icon located on your toolbar. If I click on this, I can choose horizontal fluid boxes or vertical fluid boxes. So horizontal would be items left from right. So if I click on this, I can add up to 10 fluid boxes from left to right. I can also choose vertical and choose again up to 10 fluid boxes from top to bottom. Now you want to start from perhaps a storyboard or a thumbnail sketch of what it is you're trying to achieve. You're not just going to randomly put fluid boxes on your slide. So for example, if I was designing a slide and I needed a spot for a title at the top of the canvas, maybe a larger center section where my content's going to reside, and maybe a spot for my navigation controls on the bottom, I might choose vertical and then choose three fluid boxes. Now this will actually create four fluid boxes because there will always be a parent fluid box to work from. So let's go ahead and do that and see what the effects of that are. So you'll see now my slide is divided up into three zones. You'll see that there's fluid box one. That's this little blue tab right here. And if I go into my properties inspector with fluid boxes selected, you can see that there's a fluid box selector here. So when I said there were four fluid boxes, what I meant is that there's the parent fluid box and three child fluid boxes. You can label your fluid boxes. Eventually you may not need to. It's one of those things that is optional. It gives them names to begin with. But when you're first getting started, I might recommend that you name these fluid boxes so it's easy for you to identify which one is which and which one you're selecting at any given moment. So let's start by calling our fluid box number one, which is the parent of all three. In other words, the whole slide. We'll call this one parent fluid box. Hit enter after that. And uh, the first one above that, so the first one at the top of my slide, I'm gonna call this title area. The middle one will, is where I'm going to place my content. So I'll call this center content. And my navigation controls will be in the bottom here. So I can label this navigation controls. There we go. Now, these aren't very practical sizes. Uh, one of the things that you can do is you can select your parent fluid box and that's going to reveal these selection handles between your fluid box and you can click and drag those to arrange your fluid box layout to accommodate the different sizes that you're going to need for the different content you're going to add to this slide. Uh, in this example here, you can actually select the fluid box, the title area, and navigate to your position panel and be a little bit more precise with the size of your fluid box. Now, because I'm choosing uh, fluid boxes that are on top of one another, the width is always going to be at 100%, so it's currently grayed out. But the height is something I can change. So I'm going to change that top fluid box to be 10% of the total slide. 
Similarly, I'm going to select the middle fluid box. Knowing that I want 10% for my navigation controls, I can set the height for this to be 80%. Sometimes you'll see 0.1, and actually if you add these up, you'll see that it actually comes out to be a little bit more than 100%. But it, it is, you know, it is what it is. And uh, you can be consistent uh, in the design of your layout of fluid boxes by, in fact, doing this on your master slides. And then, of course, you've got a master slide that you can use over and over again. For today's purposes, I'm just working within the standard film strip here. And let's go back to properties. And one of the things that we can do with our fluid box layout um, is to place different fill patterns into the background of these individual fluid boxes, starting, of course, with the parent fluid box. So as you can see, when I roll over these, they highlight letting me know which one I'm selecting. I'm currently, I've currently got navigation controls selected, and that's the bottom, and you can see my different tabs here that represent all the different items that we can select at any given moment. If I wish to select the parent fluid box, I can either click in the select fluid box window in my properties inspector, or I can just simply click this orange tab right here and my parent is now selected. I can choose a solid color. For example, I could make this blue color my background for my parent fluid box and I could have a different color for my title area so let's choose a color for this we'll use maybe a dark gray and we'll go about 50 percent opacity just so that we can see the background through it my navigation controls I'm going to want a little more contrast there so I think what I'll do is Choose the same gray, but this time we'll go 100%. So now you can see I've got this layout and it looks nice, of course. And if I resize it, the, the size of the fluid boxes adjust accordingly. So at the top here, let's add that text caption that will be our title. We can use text captions. Alternatively, you could use shapes with text placed within the shapes. That's fine as well. I'm going to bump up the font a little bit here and we'll change the formatting so that the title is centered and I think that looks pretty good. So let's let's click this and type in slide title. In fact, I think I might make it white text with a darker background. I think that looks good. Down here in my navigation controls, I will add some navigation controls in a minute. But as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking there's an opportunity to maybe put something other than a solid color in the background. I'm going to keep the solid color for my slide title and my navigation controls, but I think I'm going to actually put something interesting in the background. I've already gone ahead and resized a background image that I got from a Adobe stock to be the same size as my slide, so 1024 by 627. So if I select the parent fluid box, instead of a solid fill, I can choose an image fill. And from there, I can change the image itself. It gives you some defaults to choose from, none of which are actually very useful. They're really just placeholders. But I can click on this folder icon which will allow me to then navigate to a spot on my computer where I have such an image. Here's an image of an office, kind of blurred out, and we're going to make that the background of my entire parent fluid box. You're going to see this opportunity to crop and resize. I don't need to do that in this case. I could adjust the contrast and the sharpness and flip the image if it, if it was necessary, but I'm happy with everything that's here. So now we have this background. If I resize this, you can see that it's aligned to the left-hand side of the image. I think I'm going to change that to be center. I do like tiled because if I choose center here, but if I uncheck tile, what happens is it's going to stretch that image. So see what happens when we 
view this on different size devices. That doesn't look very natural, even though it is kind of abstract. So in this case here, I think we're going to stick with tiled. We'll go with centered. And I think that looks pretty good. So you can see how you can very quickly, even though fluid boxes are often criticized because you can't layer things on top of them. Well, you actually can because you can put different backgrounds in your fluid boxes. I think the one thing that's missing here, of course, is those navigation controls. So let's go down to our navigation bar, our navigation fluid box, if you will. And we'll go into the assets store in Adobe Captivate and we'll find ourselves some buttons that we can use here. I'm kind of partial to these ones here. I'm going to select this as a back button and we'll insert that into that bottom fluid box. I'm going to click away, but still within the fluid box and we'll add a forward button as well. Just a very simple level one type e-learning, of course, and we'll insert that as well. Now, this brings me to the next aspect of fluid boxes. We've covered the fact that we can label our fluid boxes. Uh, we can add fluid boxes to a parent fluid box. And of course, we can uh, fill the background with a variety of different choices, gradient fills, solid fills, and of course, images, as we've seen here. The next thing, of course, is content flow. Well, we were really dealing with content flow before when we selected our fluid boxes. The reason you have this drop down here is if for some reason you wanted to change the content flow, you certainly could. And this will apply to child level fluid boxes, but it will also apply to objects as well. Currently we're horizontal, but if I change this to vertical, my back and next buttons will now be on top of one another. It's not really what I'm looking for, but I wanted to make sure you were aware that you could change that flow of content whenever you wish. Let's put it back to horizontal. One of the things that you can do with Adobe Captivate is you can set what percentage this wrap option occurs. Now, if you're looking at your instance of Adobe Captivate and you've got a navigation control like I do in this bottom fluid box, you may not see 100% here or 90% or 80% or whatever value you've selected there. In fact, this might not even be available to you. Here's a pro tip. If you're going to be doing a lot of responsive design work, you might want to set different wrap percentages for your different fluid boxes. To do that, you need to go into your preferences. And once you have your preferences open, we're going to go into the default subcategory and we're going to enable wrap point. This will allow you to set different wrap points for each of your fluid boxes. The default is to only set it on the utmost parent fluid box, and that really doesn't give you a lot of flexibility. So with no project open, go into your preferences and make sure you enable wrap point, and that will give you this greater flexibility. Let's go ahead and click OK and see what happens with that 80% setting with a wrap to next row option. So as I reduce the size of my slide, eventually my navigation controls will wrap to another row. So my next button is no longer beside my back button. If that's not the desired effect that you wish to have, you could change your wrap option entirely to a different option. Personally, I like squeeze in a row for my navigation controls, but you could choose one row, one column, symmetrical, or leave it wrapped to next row like it is right now. I'm going to choose squeeze in a row and show you what happens here. They'll always remain side by side in this case, and that's the effect I'm looking for. Let's go back to desktop view here and consider another option related to the alignment of your fluid boxes. So we've decided that squeeze in a row makes sense. Let's take a look at these next items horizontal alignment, stretch to fit, 
vertical alignment and stretch to fit. So if I don't want to change the size of something, in other words, have it enlarged to fill the space, I may want to unselect stretch to fit. And that will make sure that my buttons don't go any larger than 100% of their normal size. I don't have to have them centered in the middle of the slide like this. I can change them to left align and they'll appear on the left hand side of that fluid box or right aligned. And I can even change the vertical alignment. So if we want to make sure that they're sticking close to the bottom, we can do that as well. Let's hold off on that idea for a second and consider uh, what we might actually want to do with things like navigation controls. Instead of center aligned, where they're two side by side, I'm thinking about what this looks like on a tablet. I'm also thinking about whether it's on a smartphone or a tablet, where are my thumbs that I might press these buttons? So you might want to consider instead of aligning them center, you can put some space between them and put them on the edge of here and here. Or my preference is actually to put space around. And again, if this were a tablet, think about where your thumbs were if you were holding it either in landscape mode or for that matter, in the case of a portrait view, the thumbs would be right there. So that I think makes a lot of sense. Let's add some content to this center content area. So first thing I'm thinking is we might have some text on the slide and maybe we've got a cutout character we'd like to add to this particular slide. So let's select the center content here and we'll use the asset store in Adobe Captivate to open this up and find maybe a cutout character that we can use that would be appropriate for this slide. So we can choose, um, let's choose Irene and we'll choose just a standard pose for Irene. I personally like using the high resolution images. As long as you use them sparingly, it shouldn't increase your project too much in size, but we'll go ahead and insert this image of Irene into our slide here. There it is. So there's our cutout character. And uh, let's see what happens when we resize that. That looks good. But let's add some text. So with our center fluid box selected, I'm going to add a text caption here. And you can see it basically fills up the remainder of that space there. I'll paste in some dummy text for right now. I think it makes sense to align that text top. So again, you're going to use the standard alignment controls for your text. And that appears up top there. So let's see what happens when we resize this and get different sizes here. Um, this is kind of weird. It seems like she's now on top of the text. And so why that's happening is that if I select my center content, we can see that our wrap option is wrapped to next row. And our current setting is basically 100%. I actually think that this, while, you know, a useful element to add personality to your e-learning, add an avatar that can guide you through the learning, is really optional to the learning itself. So one of the things that we can do is we can select Irene here and we can mark her as optional. In other words, she's not required to be there in order for the learner to read the material that's there. Now she won't disappear automatically. I'm going to click on the orange tab to select the parent fluid box, which in this case is the center content. And we're going to change this to squeeze in a row. Now this whole idea of optional content will be based on this percentage that we see right here. So let's say if we drop below 70% of our desktop view size, we would like anything that's marked as optional to disappear. The text is important. The learners need to read the text or see the uh, infographic or whatever information you're on there. But our cutout characters are really there for aesthetic purposes. So what's going to happen is as space becomes a premium, Irene will disappear. 
Another feature of fluid boxes is the ability to add padding. As you can see, the text is real close to the edge of my fluid boxes here. And I don't really care for that. So let's make sure I'm selecting the fluid box for that particular text item here. And let's add a few pixels all on all sides here. I'm going to say, just guessing, 20 pixels is probably nice. Gives us a little white space around the text. And this will apply to our cutout character as well when we see this on full view. So let's just kind of scroll across and see what happens with this information as we see it there. I think that looks pretty good. Incidentally, because she's a person who seemingly is standing on that background, one of the things that you might want to do with this particular fluid box is to align for the bottom so her feet stay on the ground, so to speak. Uh, that's just a little tip from me to you there. One of the things that sometimes happens is that you may wish to have a series of objects that are going to all be equal in size. So let's duplicate this slide and show you an example of what I'm talking about there. So let's say I don't have these char this character in that text, but I have a series of objects that might be on the slide like so. And I'll just duplicate this a number of times. And we'll drag those so they snap into the fluid box here behind them. Okay, so there's our objects there. Uh, and think in this case, we probably want to middle align it. But if some reason, for some reason, let's say one of these is not sized correctly and you want to quickly fix that, there is a distribute objects equally button on here. The one forewarning is that they will distort the aspect ratio of those objects. So you might want to use this sparingly. For something like a smart shape that might contain some text or just some background images in the, in the actual objects themselves, it's probably fine. But for things that you know have to have a certain shape and size, like images, you might want to avoid using the distribute objects equally. So I'm just going to press Control Z and Control Z again to get it back to what it's supposed to be there. Let's go back to our original slide here and we'll talk a little bit about static fluid boxes. So in an instant like this, let's duplicate this slide once more, get rid of our character and our text. Perhaps there was a situation where we wanted to include a series of infographics that would appear one after the other. So what I can do is I can actually grab these from my computer. I've got them on my desktop already and drag them into the slide here. And of course they show up in the middle here. Uh, if I actually get them into the fluid box, the default, of course, with Captivate is to just stack them side by side one another. You can't layer them on top of one another. And unfortunately, that's what I'm looking for. The reason you might do this is, like I said, you might have the items appear on your timeline. And if we have them appear for, let's say, nine seconds, and item one appears for the first three seconds, Item two appears for the next three seconds. And then item four appears for the last three seconds. And I will just extend the duration of my other objects so they don't disappear. The problem is, again, I want them to be stacked on top of one another instead of um, like you see them here. The effect works. It starts off with the first one, transitions to the next one, and then on to the third one, but I can't layer them on top of one another in a regular fluid box. The solution is to select the fluid box and turn that fluid box into a static fluid box. And that's going to maintain the relative position of the objects that are within that fluid box. So if I do that, 
and then resize these to basically fill that fluid box, which I can easily do. We'll just make this nice and large here and we can reposition it till it's centered on the slide. I'm just eyeballing this right now. And if we select the remaining fluid boxes, we can even use our alignment toolbar to make sure that they're all in the same spot and the same size. Looks a little blurry here, but that will correct itself as soon as we start to resize it. So this creates the effect that we need of having one infographic display and replace the next one and so on. One thing I'll need to remember to do, and this is not so much a responsive design issue, but the pause point for my back and next button, we're going to want to push that out a little bit later on the slide, perhaps to about eight seconds so that, you know, the animation will all occur before the slide gets paused. But this should work nicely. The problem with static fluid boxes, it's a great solution, but unfortunately what happens is that it fixes the aspect ratio of that fluid box, that center fluid box. So as we resize it, the width and the height of the fluid box remains the same. And I'm left with these dead spaces here and here. And I for, unfortunately can't recover those. Later when I go through the example of how you could convert an existing blank project or non-responsive design project, I'll show you another solution. But I definitely wanted to make sure you were aware of the shortcomings that a static fluid box has. So as you can see here, we've seen um, pretty much everything that is within the controls here. There's a couple of small things that are outside of the fluid box properties inspector that you should be aware of. So if we click into the scrap area so that we reveal our standard slide properties panel, you'll see there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. First of all, when you're doing responsive design, you have the opportunity to allow gesture navigation. Essentially, there's a series of controls that users can use to allow them to navigate through a responsive design course like this. You can preview it by going into the window dropdown and selecting mobile palette. So these are the controls that will be available to users. You can long tap to play, pause your movie, play or pause the movie. Navigation can be achieved through swiping left or right. You can pinch to zoom and you can show and hide your table of contents by double tapping your screen, but also show hide your play bar by swiping up or swiping down. So these are on by default in a responsive design project. You can actually uncheck it from your mobile palette and make it not available to the entire course. However, you can also turn it off on a slide by slide basis. For example, if you had a knowledge check slide, you may not want people to skip past that question slide. So again, turning off gesture navigation will give, uh, give you full control of what the learner can navigate to or from. The other controls to be aware of, and especially important for a slide like this, are these controls down here. Minimum font size and enable uniform text scaling. What happens here with minimum font size, there comes a point where this font is too large for a mobile phone. So you can set lower minimum font sizes, even though it might be set for 20 points here uh, on a mobile phone, it will scale down to those smaller sizes. So you might need to lower this. I found about 10 is the lowest that I usually like to go. Now, if you have multiple objects on the same slide that all contain the same style of text, one of the things that you might want to do is enable uniform text scaling. And the reason for that is, let's say you have one of these objects contain more text than the other. What's going to happen is that this is going to shrink at a faster rate than this one is. 
if the content is like material, in other words, it's two sets of the same type of material, you would want it to shrink at the same rate so that it doesn't look out of place. So enabling uniform text scaling is something I would strongly recommend if you have multiple text objects that are similar to one another. Of course, if you've totally messed up your fluid box responsive design and wish to simply start from scratch, you can click on remove fluid boxes and essentially be left with a single parent fluid box and you can start all over again if you're unsatisfied with the results. So that concludes the first part of our workshop today. Just an overview of the features that allow you to build fluid box responsive design in Adobe Captivate. At this point, we're going to switch gears and we're going to take an existing blank project and I will show you my process for converting that from a blank or non-responsive design project over to a mobile responsive design. And some of the decisions and some of the strategies I take in doing so, I will be sharing with you. Okay, I've gone ahead and closed the previous project and we're just to the welcome page of Adobe Captivate. I'm on the new project screen. Uh, but in this case here, I'm going to ask you to open up the exercise file or project file that I've supplied for this particular workshop. So we need you to click on the file drop down menu and select open. Navigate to where you've saved that file. I've saved mine to the desktop and I've called this project file start hyphen taking action against harassment blank project. This is actually just a handful of slides from the original version of this project but it should be enough for us to work with what we need to do today. Now the very first thing that we need to do, this is currently a non-responsive blank project. We need to convert it to responsive design. I could simply copy and paste the slides from this project into a responsive design project, make a few changes. That would work as well, but Adobe has been very thoughtful to provide us with the opportunity to save a blank project as responsive and that's from the file drop down menu and you can select save as responsive here. Now you'll see this warning some of the items in non-responsive projects may not be supported after the upgrade. Do you wish to proceed? Uh, in this case here it's safe to go ahead and save because I haven't included any such uh, objects or items so we'll go ahead and we'll hit save we need to give it a different name. I'm going to call this uh, completed and we'll change the last bit there to responsive instead of blank. Okay, so this is the completed taking, it's not completed yet, but it will become the completed taking action against harassment responsive project. So go ahead and save that. You'll see some crazy stuff happening on your screen as it reloads the same project in a responsive design template like what we see here. Now the first thing I typically do when I'm converting an existing project, uh, I take a look at the slides that I have and I consider what do I need to change about these slides to make them work within a responsive design project. Similarly, if I was starting from scratch, I would look at a storyboard and take a look at all the slide requirements that I have and consider is there anything that I can build on a master slide, uh, especially if there's a very similar layout and format for many of these slides. Now this one here is the title slide. It looks pretty much um, like it's probably going to only be used once for a course. You might have it for different lessons or modules, um, but there's probably not a huge need to have many versions of it, but I think we'll still go ahead and build a master slide version of it. If you take a look at the four remaining slides, there's definitely some common layout elements on these slides. Basically, regardless of what you're seeing in the middle content area, you're still seeing a title area and a bar along the bottom to handle any kind of navigation that you might need. 
So I think we should start there. Let's take a look at our title slide. We'll click on the Properties Inspector icon and we'll go to Master Slide View so we can take a look at what's here already. Now these got kind of converted a little strangely. I think in this case it would make a lot more sense for us to build brand new master slides for each of these particular slides here. Uh, in this case here I'm just going to insert a new content master slide and this will have nothing on it. And we can exit the master slide and just return to the title slide here and take a look at what our needs are. I think we're going to need a fluid box at the top just as a placeholder or a space holder if you will. We'll need a fluid box directly below it and we will divide that up into three fluid boxes just to give us the white space that we need on either side of the title. Similarly we'll have a subtitle fluid box here and a fluid box at the bottom for navigation. So I'm thinking we're going to start with four fluid boxes and we can roughly copy what we're seeing here. So let's go to the master slide view and we'll, we'll click on this new title, this new blank master slide here. And maybe we'll just call that new title just so that it's clear. Now I can select fluid boxes to be added to this master slide and any slide that uses this master slide will have those fluid boxes there by default. But you won't be limited in your ability to add additional fluid boxes or additional child level fluid boxes. And we'll probably see that happen a couple of times during this portion of the workshop. So again, remember we needed four fluid boxes. So I'm going to go ahead and create those. Now they're not all going to be equal in size like this. But I think we're pretty close, like we're going to have a blank area here, our title's going to go here, our subtitle's going to go here, and we'll just have maybe a smaller fluid box for the navigation bar at the bottom. We already have our background, so that's fine. Uh, if we didn't for some reason, we certainly could select a fill pattern to go into the background here, uh, but I think this will work fine. Well, actually, no. Now that I look at it here, I think we should probably change that background fill because uh, I don't want it to be distorted like that presently is. So let's go with image fill and we'll go find that very same image in the background here. It's an Adobe stock image that I've imported. Click OK. Click OK. And the important thing here is we're just going to tile that image. If we stretch it, of course, we'll see the image distorted, but tile is fine. And I'm going to select center just to keep it centered on the slide. So this should work nicely for our situation here. Now let's select our fluid box. Let's start off with our parent fluid box. Now I don't want this to wrap to next column in the event that we're seeing a very weird size. So we're going to make sure that we're squeezing a column for all of these. This is really just a placeholder, so I'm not worried about that. This middle one, I'm going to divide into three sections. So three child level fluid boxes will go in here. Now, I'm going to choose uh, position and make that probably, I think, about 20% on either side here and the title will remain in there. Let's go back to properties. Now this should be squeeze in a row because I don't want these to wrap. So we'll choose squeeze in a row and that should work fine. Uh, now this will be where our, our other subtitle or subtitle will go and then down here let's change that position to say 10%. I think will work nicely. With this fluid box at the bottom, let's choose a color for it and we'll make it 100%. So we can add some placeholder objects to make it easy to design. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make this middle fluid box, the entire thing, white 
and probably about 30%. I just want it to be a little bit different and then we'll place our title here and we may still have that title from the original theme. So I'm going to insert a placeholder object and we'll call it title for right now. I am going to change it to a rectangle here and see if I have a title title, if you will. <laughs> Standard. No, that's not the one I'm looking for. Let's exit from here and let's see what we have here. So this is a modified title. I'm going to create a new style from this original object here and we'll call this title slide title. Okay. Now let's return to our master slide view and we'll go to our new title here. We'll select this object here and we'll go and select title slide title. So that's the effect I'm really looking for here. Now down here at the bottom, I'm going to want that subtitle. So let's go ahead and choose insert placeholder objects and we'll choose subtitle down here. Let's exit the master slide just for a moment, select this object and I'm going to save changes to the existing style so that this becomes our subtitle smart shape style. Let's return to the master slide view and check out our slide and it's, it's actually already inherited that particular uh, item there. There is a rounded rectangle. It's not going to be necessary in this case here, so I'll just set that up to be a rectangle as well. So I think we have most of everything that we need here. Um, there are the, you could put a placeholder object for navigation controls, but I'm going to keep those on the film strip there. So I think we're good here and we can see what this looks like uh, when we view it on different size devices. I think that works for what I have in mind. So I'm going to go ahead and exit the master slide here. And in this case, what we'll do is select the new responsive design master slide to be for our new slide here. So everything should work. Now, some of these objects will be actually unlocked from fluid boxes. So we definitely want to make sure that we just kind of drag them around and make sure they snap to the appropriate fluid box in case they've become unlocked. I'm going to change uh, my approach with begin buttons and continue buttons and previous buttons and things like that. One of the problems with using shapes as buttons with text is that as you change the size of the layout, the text may be problematic to see and also the button may be too large or too small. So I'm going to switch to iconography. This is just a choice that I'm making. It's up to you what you do, but I'm going to delete this button here. I have them. I'll make sure they're in the library file. They're not there now, but I'm just going to drag them in from my desktop. They're the white version of these same two images here. So I'll drag them both in and now they're actually in my library and I'll make sure that that gets saved for you so you can use that as well. So this will be my new begin button. I'll just drag that down to the bottom there and it's going to be by itself. So I don't really need to worry about the layout too much of that particular fluid box. We will need to be concerned about our navigation area for other particular slides as well. So let's set that up to have some, uh, to be as a button, first of all, and the action will be to simply go to next slide. And I like to select the hand cursor and disable the click sound. So I think we have our title slide. This is going to work well. Um, let's just double check what it looks like on different size screens. Don't worry if the fonts look a little wonky at this point. Uh, this slide will have font scaling. So you'll be able to allow the font to shrink in size depending on the size of device that you're working with there. Now, next we're going to need a master slide for 
basically all the remaining slides here and it shouldn't be too difficult or complicated to build. So let's go to our master slide view. And I think what we'll do is we'll insert a new content master slide. Again, we're starting off with a blank and this we'll call standard responsive slide. Okay. Now we know that the background is going to be the same. We know that there's going to be a title area across the top and a navigation bar at the bottom. So we can choose fluid boxes for that particular layout. And I think that's just three fluid boxes. We'll start off by selecting squeeze in a column because regardless of what size screen we'll be looking at this on, these three fluid boxes will always be in that configuration. The parent fluid box is taken care of. Now we need to look at our other fluid boxes. So this is where the title will go. Only one object in there, so I really don't need to worry about wrap options, and it's gonna fill that fluid box. But I do need it to be a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna select position, and we'll just type in 10%. I think that works well. Similarly, we're going to set the bottom fluid box to also be 10% and that works well as well. Now there will be multiple objects in here, back and next buttons, possibly submit buttons on question slides, things like that. So you're probably going to want to set this up to be squeeze in a row and we're probably going to set it up to be space around. The other thing I want to do is make it a dark gray or almost black color like before. So we'll select the appropriate color from our color palette. And I think I'll make this 100% there. Now, I do need a title placeholder. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that here. So this will be a placeholder object. And we'll just call that title. And that already has the design that I'm looking for. I will change it to a rectangle so that it's always a rectangle. And when we create slides that use this, we'll double click to add the title and we should be good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and exit this master slide and we can now start applying that master slide to these slides here. But let's pause for a moment and take a look at our needs for this particular slide. In this example, let's just do a quick preview or playback of this slide here. So what I have is a cutout character and I have some bullet points that are coming in on a case by case basis, originally timed with some narration, which I've actually now removed. But you notice that there's a second set of bulleted items that comes over the same location as the first set. And that can be problematic because of course, as we already know, fluid boxes uh, items in fluid boxes can't occupy the same space. You can't really overlap them. So my solution for a slide like this is that I would actually duplicate this slide and turn it into two separate slides. One with the first set of bulleted items and then a second slide with the second set of bulleted items. So before we start mucking about too much with this slide, Let's go ahead and duplicate this slide so that we have a second copy of it. And in the case of the first version of the slide, let's open it up. We'll keep these first five items here, but what we'll do is we'll delete the second set of objects. So they will no longer reside on the first version of that slide and you would need to edit your audio narration for this slide. So you basically turn it into two files, one with the first half of the narration and then a second with the second half. But in this case here, for our purposes today, I'm just gonna shorten this and then we'll select these objects and use a wonderful keyboard shortcut, Control or Command E to extend these objects for the rest of this slide. Similarly, we're going to go to slide now number three and we'll delete the first set of objects because they would have already been shown on that first slide. 
we'll get rid of those and we can select all of these bulleted items and you would just have to remember to bring in the new audio for this slide and then adjust the position of these objects so that they show up in time with the narration and like before I'll just extend these to display for the rest of this slide and again using that same keyboard shortcut control E and now everything's perfect so first thing I'm going to do and this is sort of my workflow here is I'm going to just take my objects that are currently on the slide and just drag them out into the scrap area so the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to apply our master slide that contains all the particular fluid boxes that we need. So if I select this from here, we can now select standard responsive slide as our new layout. It actually snapped in the title, which is fine. And I'm going to replace uh, the continue button with a icon button. So we'll just delete that. And now what I can do is I can select the middle fluid box. Now remember, this middle fluid box is coming from my master slide, but it doesn't mean that I can't add child level fluid boxes on the film strip view. So I need a place for my cutout character to go, and I need a place for these bulleted items to appear. So I'm going to divide this fluid box into two horizontal child fluid boxes. And you can see those in the fluid box selector here. Now I don't need my cutout character to use up half of this area. So I can arbitrarily just pick a size that is appropriate for her here. Before I drag her into that, I actually want to crop her. I don't need the full height of her. As you can see, I've used a full height image and that's rather large. It would shrink down if I did so, but I just want to maybe crop her just below the waist here. So you can select the image and go to edit image and then we can select crop and then just select the selection handles and decide how much of the original image you wish to keep. I think that's a good amount there. We'll click OK. And we now have a slightly larger image and we can drag her directly into that fluid box. That looks pretty good. Now, the next thing we need to do is take our objects here and we're going to drag those into the other fluid box beside her. Now, they kind of don't look the way I would expect them to look. They're not terrible, but we want some space around them, I think. So we're going to do some things with these fluid boxes. Now, I'm going to set it up so that the cutout character fluid box disappears when there's not enough room to display all this content. So we're going to have to select the parent fluid box here and make sure that it's set up to wrap to next row. Now, that may not always be the case, but for this slide it is. So we'll leave wrap to next row on the master slide, but we'll do squeeze in a row for this version of it here. We'll select the cutout character fluid box, and there's two things I want to do here. I want to, first of all, make sure that the alignment is at the bottom, because, of course, if I resize this, she's going to look like she's floating in space and unfortunately has lost her legs. So I'm going to change that to bottom align. And we also want to mark her fluid box as optional. So when we get to a smaller size screen, she'll disappear. We won't have room to show her on a smartphone. Uh, so that fluid box will disappear. And of course, you would only do that if the image that you were displaying in such a fluid box was for aesthetic purposes only. An avatar is really just there for those sorts of purposes and doesn't contribute to the learning objectives of the course. So now I'm going to select this fluid box that contains this stuff here 
and we're going to add some padding around these fluid boxes so that they're separated from one another. Um, you could probably keep them with this maintain aspect ratio selected. That often will be the default for many objects that you work with. But because text has the risk of possibly being cut off there, I'm going to actually uncheck maintain aspect ratio and then allow these objects to use the full space that's available to them. I think it'll create a better situation when we're looking at this on mobile view. So let's go back to desktop view for a moment. That looks pretty good. The only thing we're missing now, of course, is our um, navigation controls here. So let's go to our library. We did add those before and they should appear in one of these sets here. So let's bring in one of those. Make sure you're popping it into the correct fluid box. And one of these as well. I'll just drag them so that they're in the correct order. These are presently not set up as buttons, so we'll make sure that we select use as button for both of those. First one will be a back button, so the action will not be go to next slide, but instead go to previous slide. And like before, I'm going to use the hand cursor and disable the click sound. And we'll do that for the next button as well. So there we have another slide that I think works quite well. Uh, again, um, if we want to control at what point the um, cutout character will disappear, we can select the utmost parent and change this wrap option percentage. So if you want to keep her around a little longer, you can lower the number and uh, have her appear for more devices. Uh, I would say anything less than about here. So we can just scroll that up. Yeah, I think 70 is a good percentage there. So that looks pretty good. We're going to do the same thing to this slide real quickly here. We'll start off by selecting our standard responsive slide here. I'm going to just delete this character and we will divide up the fluid boxes in the exact same percentages here in the middle. Let's go back here and check what that percentage is. So 76.8%, maybe we'll just drop that down to a, an even number of 75%. We'll do the same thing to this fluid box here, 75. And we can borrow our cutout character, I'll copy, and we'll paste her in here. I'm going to select the fluid box that she's currently in and uh, we'll make sure that it's optional and bottom aligned. Like before, we'll make sure that our percentage is set to 70. I believe that's what it was. And now we can select our bulleted items here and we'll drag them into the second fluid box, like so. We'll apply those same settings here where we Put a little padding around the outside and we'll select our objects. And go to properties and make sure maintain aspect ratio is unselected. I missed a couple for some reason there. <laughs> there we go. So that looks, looks pretty good to me. And yeah, we'll just take a quick check there. I didn't set up the parent of these two to squeeze in a row, which is what we really want there. So that should work well. And uh, to make sure all of these are set up the same, we can distribute the ob objects equally. And that should keep it the way we want it to look here. I'm going to delete this continue button. And there's an extra box here that's no longer necessary because the fluid box takes care of that for me. And I'll just borrow these back and next buttons that I've already created and paste those on the first slide here. Now this slide, you know, the, the back and next buttons, 
a couple of things that you might want to consider doing. Uh, we're going to go to the timing panel. First of all, have them appear for the rest of the slide. And I think for the first slide, I'm not going to pause them at all. It'll play through and start the new set of bulleted items uh, as if they were really just the same slide. However, on this one here, we will also extend those for the rest of the slide. But the pause point, I want to make sure it happens after any navigation. So. We'll just set this to pause at nine seconds instead of one and a half to ensure that all of our effects have had come, uh, an opportunity to come in. And that should be fine there. Okay, so we're well on the way to finishing this project out here. This one is very similar to what we've already had, so this shouldn't take too long at all. Again, I'm just going to delete the continue and this extra bar down here, which we won't need. And we'll just select our master, uh, master slide with the fluid boxes already added. And we'll take our character here. We'll edit the image. Choose crop. And just make a smaller, shorter version. Something like that I think is good. And we'll take our fluid box in the middle here. First of all, let's make sure everything is good there our fluid box in the middle we'll also want to squeeze in a row and add two child level fluid boxes and we'll use the selection handle to bring it approximately where i think it will need to be brought to and we'll drag our cutout character in here again don't forget to make sure that that fluid box is optional and align to the bottom so again she doesn't look like she's had her legs chopped off and these items here can go in the fluid box on the left and like before we'll just add some padding to that fluid box just so there's lots of space there and for the sake of smaller screen sizes we'll uncheck maintain aspect ratio and i think that will work real well we need our navigation controls, so we can just copy those and bring those over from the previous slide and paste them down here. I think we're doing well here. Two more slides to go, and I think we're in great shape. Now, this one's going to be a little bit different because we have this content carousel in the middle with a left button, the content itself, which is a multi-state object, a right button which advances you through that content carousel our cutout character so let's first of all apply our standard responsive slide master slide so that we have all the elements that we need we can delete the stuff we're going to get rid of here at the bottom and in this case here our middle fluid box will actually need will need four child level fluid boxes in a horizontal format here because we need a fluid box for each of our uh, items here and now of course we just need to resize these i'm going to take a guess here and say that 10 percent on the side is good this fluid box will also be 10 percent and then maybe a bit more room for this one here. Let's go 50%. And let's move our cutout character out of the way. And it might be a little easier to work on these items if they're off the slide there. So let's select our parent fluid box here. And I think that's going to need to be a little bit larger there. 10. Actually, I'm thinking 8 might be enough. 8%. 50%. 8%. And whatever's left will be for our cutout character. So 
I don't really need to worry about padding for these little arrows because the buttons themselves already have some space in them. I'll just drag those into the appropriate fluid boxes. Our content, again, is a multi-state object. We'll pop that in the middle. I think in this case here, we're going to uncheck maintain aspect ratio, but I am going to change the align to a middle align, and I think that will look better for all of the different steps here. So let's just check those. Yeah, I think that looks good. But we might want a little padding, especially at the top there. Let's take a look at uh, maybe about 20, but a bit more for the top here, just to give us more white space. And this one here will be our optional fluid box where our cutout character will go. And we'll make sure that the parent of this whole set of child level fluid boxes is squeezed in a row so our optional fluid box will work. Now you've seen me edit these outside of fluid boxes and I'll show you why that I do that. If I drag it into my fluid box, sure it resizes it and I can still edit. And if I crop it here, It will work, but unfortunately it will distort the image when I'm done. So I'm going to select this. I'm going to unlock it just to fix this issue and then reset to original size and it brings the aspect ratio back. And now I can bring it back, uh, make sure to uncheck unlock from fluid box. And now that looks much better. So again, we're going to want to make sure that the bottom alignment is chosen here. And I think we're pretty much good to go. And of course we can add our navigation controls for this slide. Copy those. We'll paste those down here. And that leaves us with one final slide here to work on. This is again very similar to what we had before. These are click to reveals, kind of like flip cards in a way. We'll, of course, first of all, select our standard responsive slide here. So our placeholder goes into the top here. Once again, I'm going to delete the stuff that's going to get replaced on this slide. I think what I'll do is I'll just move my little flip cards here off to the side so they're out of the way. And same thing for my cutout character here. We'll start by setting up the slide to work the way that we want. We'll add our fluid boxes, our child level fluid boxes. I think we only need the two. And we'll just pick a size here. You can be more precise by selecting the fluid box. We'll say maybe 25% is a good choice here. And let's select our character here. And we'll go to properties, edit the image. And we'll crop again like we did before. And we'll just choose a size that's good for this particular character here. And we can drag her into that fluid box. Once again, we'll have to make sure the fluid box is set up to be bottom aligned so that that works. And optional so she disappears as well. Let's make sure our parent, the two fluid boxes that make up the middle, the parent of that is squeezed in a row so that optional content will work. And we should be good to go in every other way. Let's see here. Let's select our big clickers as I call them. <laughs> we'll pop those onto the slide here. And we'll just add some padding here. Whatever is appropriate for your design and Let's make sure that maintain aspect ratio is not selected. So there we go. That's pretty good to go. And we just need our navigation controls. We'll copy those. You can see how much time we saved by building these master slides to already have our fluid boxes. 
and I think we're okay to test this out now. So let's just do a quick preview. I'm going to choose live preview on devices. This is a great way to find problems uh, right within your browser because you can come up with all sorts of different um, sizes that you might run into. You can also use this QR code to scan on a mobile phone like an iPhone or an Android device and preview your course on an actual mobile device to see what the results are. For my purposes here today, I'm just going to click on the link. You have to be on the same network for that to work. Uh, I'm going to turn off my, my actual play bar controls because again, I'm providing those back and next controls. So here's my welcome slide. I already see a problem. I'm missing my, my full slide in effect there. We'll go back and look at that. So here's my taking action slide. What happens if I'm on a different size device? You'll see that the optional content goes away and that seems to work quite well. We continue on to the second slide. It works good. Everything there is fine. We'll keep it in a mobile view here for now. And these are the four steps to resolve conflict there. We're not seeing our cutout character, but if we were full desktop screen, we would see her. And here is my content carousel. That works fine. Let's see what that looks like on a smaller screen. Works good. There's some formatting issues there, but nothing too major, of course. And then we have our click to reveal items here. Again, some formatting I got to fix there, but otherwise everything works according to plan here. So I think that's good. Let's turn off that skin editor, turn off the playback controls, and we won't have any borders on that as well. You can choose the HTML background color, so if you like the gray color that we're using here, we can set that to work fine. And uh, so let's take a look at a couple of the, the issues here. Um, I noticed that some of the objects in here were a little bit wonky with each other. Sometimes distributing objects equally will fix that. Just make sure that these are all using the same object style. This one's a little bit different because of the bullet points, but that's okay. And like before, we've got that, that everything looks good here. And I think we're okay for the most part. And I noticed a couple of issues with my formatting here, which are easy to fix. We are just missing some bold text here, which we'll do. That looks good. And these looked a little funny as well. So too, too big. The text was too big for here. Let's make sure they're all the same. Uh, 25 is good. 25. and 25. So they're all very consistent now. Don't forget that you can work with your minimum font size. If you find it necessary, you can lower this. I didn't notice any issues there, but maybe just as a safety precaution, we'll just add 12 points. I think designing responsive design is a little bit of a different mindset than uh, designing for a desktop view. And there are certainly occasions where, uh, you know, if there is a little bit more text, you might want to lower that and possibly even enable uniform text scaling. Shouldn't really have that issue, but for example, this top sentence here is a little bit longer than perhaps this third bullet point here. 
And if you wanted to ensure consistency of these fonts, enabling uniform text scaling would certainly solve that problem for you. Uh, let's do one more preview here and see how that works. I'll just do the standard preview now. We'll see if we get the desired results that we're looking for. So here's our course. Oh, I forgot to fix the timing. Let's do that right now. Got to watch that. That's a common problem that, that folks sometimes miss. Let's extend the duration of our next button and make sure the pause is occurring after our slide in effect here. So let's set the pause point to be four seconds should probably be enough. And that's done right here within the timing panel. We can just double check that the all the other pause points are after any animation is occurring. This looks good to me and good to me as well. So we'll preview this now. Nice. That's what I was looking for. And of course, on a mobile phone, you get this effect here. I like that. That looks pretty good. I might reduce this size or even make these optional content items or optional fluid boxes so that, you know, the respect in the workplace fills the screen a little bit more. But for the most part, it looks good. So here's our taking action slide. We've got the bulleted text. What's this look like on a mobile phone? Looks pretty good to me. I like that. Goes on to the next slide. And of course, there would normally be narration here for this slide. And we'll see what the next slide looks like. I didn't realize these were in reverse order, but that's okay. And we have our little content carousel there. It looks good on all different size screens. And here's our example scenario that we get to see. Great. So sometimes you'll get these cut out, these pop out text items. There could be something in that particular item. And let's take a look at it there. It could be that there are, there's too much text or maybe the text formatting is a little bit off. So I think it's probably more to do with the slide itself. Uh, so maybe what we would choose is uh, enable uniform text scaling or maybe even lower this as well. But again, you can tweak these settings on a slide by slide basis. And don't forget, of course, you also can turn on or off gesture navigation for any of these slides. And when you publish this project, you can turn on or off gesture navigation for the entire project as well. But I'm pretty happy with this. I'm going to save this project file and include it so that you can compare your own attempt to build a similar project file starting with the start version of this project, the non-responsive blank project version, and see if you can get similar results as to myself. Thanks very much for attending our workshop here today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the Adobe eLearning World Conference. If you thought this video was helpful, please like and share it with your colleagues. If you need help with Adobe Captivate, hire Paul for one-on-one -on -one instruction. Paul's goal is to focus on lessons based on your specific needs. Visit his website at CaptivateTeacher.com. And don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel.